What is going on, guys? Welcome to another edition, one of the last editions. Can only have a few more of these. NBA Lineup HQ Showdown Show for the NBA Finals. This is Game 3 between the Golden State Warriors and the Boston Celtics. We've head back to Boston in a 1-1 series. Two very almost like polar opposite games uh, so far to start the series with one, the Celtics running away with the game in the fourth quarter. In game one, just totally dominating. And then in game two, the Warriors completely running away with the game in game three, or uh, in, in the third quarter. Uh, so much so that the Celtics literally benched all their starters with like 11 minutes left to go in the game. So it's been a very um, up and down series for sure so far. I, of course, am your co-host Eric Beinfort and joined by John Breslin, Squirrel Patrol. John, has there been any like big takeaway or anything you've had so far through these first two games or just like general thoughts overall? Well, Boston's looked a little bit better than I than I expected. I mean, I thought Golden State was going to easily win the, the two games at home, and they didn't. And, mm. and Boston was able to sneak one. Uh, and I, I think they're a better team than I had thought. And I actually, like, I was thinking about like betting the the Boston. I think the line's like three and a half or four. Um, mm-hmm. I think they could win this game pretty handily. Um, and they're they're a better team than I expected. Interesting. Um... That, I, I, that's an interesting angle because I don't think that that's like the general public consensus. You know, yeah. one thing that happens in the playoffs all the time, though, is like there's all these ebbs and flows, right? The Celtics are probably the perfect example of this team. They never lost two games in a row, but they almost never won two, two games in a row. You know, it was basically just like ping-ponging a good game, like we saw a good quarter or a good half, like we saw in game one, to a little bit of struggles, right? They have some turnover issues. When just when Steph Curry and and the Jordan Poole and these guys get hot, that's what happens. But we we've seen that with the Celtics, and so the sentiment on the Celtics is like constantly ping ponging. Like after game one, everybody's like, "Oh man, the Warriors are in trouble," and then the Warriors beat the crap out of them, and now it's like, "Oh, see, yep, the Warriors are fine." You know, this is this is still the Warriors, and I tend to agree with you. Um, I've been doing these the last couple of these shows with Chop, and that's kind of my, my my belief is that the Celtics are the better team. Now the Warriors have the best player. And Steph Curry and the guy that can just do stuff and make, you know, chaos happen on the floor just by just being out there. He doesn't even have to do stuff just by standing at the three point line like Steph Curry causes so much chaos. So um, was there anything outside of that kind of our both our high level macro um, takes? I agree. I, I really like the Celtics heading back to Boston here off of a bad game. But was there anything like from a, you know, maybe from a DFS perspective, rotations, matchups, anything like that that really stuck out? Nothing. I mean, I, I think like Robert Williams is still hurt. Like it, it it's kind of clear. Uh, like he, I don't think he played like he played very few minutes in the second half last game. And he like it, he almost seems to be getting worse and worse. Um, yep. And then Derek White is playing a lot more minutes, which I, people kind of expected. I mean, I think like on, on the scores and odds, like people have been betting that the uh, Derek White over points, rebounds, and assists. And, like, I've been going in there every day trying to get it before somebody else gets it. Yep. Like, it's yep. right up as my pick or whatever. But I've been betting <laughs> right. every every game in the series. Um, and it's hit. And it his minutes have increased every series so far. Um, and I think he's been over 30 minutes both games in this series. And with, you know, Golden State being a little more guard-oriented, that's not a huge surprise. It, it almost seems strange that the line, like the prop line, is not adjusting more. Um, yeah. So like we're seeing a little bit less Robert Williams, a little bit, maybe a little bit more Grant Williams than we would have expected. Um, and Derek White has just been playing big minutes. And I think like people have been calling out like Jalen Brown's uh, handle on on Twitter. <laughs> and, like, yeah. and I think Derek White playing more minutes isn't a coincidence. Like they're trying to get another like point guard in there uh, to help with like Marcus Smart so that Jalen Brown doesn't have to handle the ball so much. Yeah. And and Jason Tatum, like they, they don't have. Tatum, Brown, and Smart are all awesome basketball players, right? And they all have an incredible skill set, you know, whether it's scoring, defense, shooting, whatever. There's not a traditional point guard amongst amongst that group. Like Tatum actually brings the ball up a lot um, just because they want to have, you know, they want to initiate their offense through him. But then he's like getting hounded, you know, up and down the floor by Wiggins or Gary Payton or, or whatever. Derek White enables that, right? He is more of a traditional point guard. He was a 1A, 1B point guard in San Antonio with DeJounte Murray. And so he allows a little bit more ball movement, a little more ball handling. And then on defense, um, which is where maybe they need him even more, like Marcus Smart is incredible. He's not the prototypical like chase Steph Curry around defender. And that's just Derek White is so, so good at that. Like if you watched him in the Heat series, he was always guarding the the Max Struess 
Duncan Robinson, Tyler Hero, or whatever. And those guys play like Steph Curry and Clay Thompson. They're just running around trying to get three pointers. And he is so good at chasing that, chasing that guy. Now Steph has gotten loose a little bit in the pick and roll, which we can talk more specifics about uh, later. But uh, it, do you have any real reason to go away from? from Derek white. He's been kind of my guy too, in this series. I bet him, I played him in showdown. I played him in the series, you know, the series long showdown. Is there any reason to get away from him here? I don't think so. And especially with Boston going back home, I I was looking up his, like his home road splits and like most players, like he, he averages more points and assists and rebounds at home, you know, this season compared to to on the road. It was, it was actually funny because I max, uh, I didn't max center, but I had a bunch of tickets for like the FanDuel and DraftKings um, single game, uh, you know, for the, for game one. And I I lost money, um, you know, I was entering like the, um, you know, all all my lineups. And then I was just at a, um, I was at a birthday party for the last game. I think it was on Sunday. It's like a kid's birthday party, right? And I was like, just entering (laughs) lineups on my phone because I saw that it was about to like, the contests were about to get filled. I put in a bunch of Derek White at captain and I won money. <laughs> you know, said <laughs> like Derek White at, at, at captain, like almost all of my lineups. Um, and he funny. did really well. Uh, so yeah, I don't think there's any reason to get away from him. Is is there anything on the Golden State side that surprised you? Like the rotation's pretty much been what I expected. Uh, but then I guess they do have some injury, you know, some guys that are kind of in and out of the lineup with injuries, but like Gary Payton, Andre Guadala, and Anato Porter. Yeah, they're definitely the trickier one to figure out. I think um, wrapping up the Boston side, I agree 100% with everything you said. You are going to get as much Tatum and Brown as we can handle. And honestly, I think we might get a lot more Horford. I mean, he was terrible in the last game, too. But to your point on Robert Williams, I just – even if he were healthy, I don't know that this is the perfect series for him. Um, they can use some of the things that he can provide. But, I mean, there was one point in the last game where I think he even blocked a shot. But then, like, he came down. It's like a, a a dog that injures his leg and is, like, you know, walking or even, like, running. But he's ne- that other foot is never touching the ground. He, like, blocked a shot and came down, and he wouldn't allow his one leg to touch the ground. He's, like, walking around on one on one leg. So I just, I just don't see how he plays more. And I think that's going to lead to, obviously, like I said, Tatum Brown, Horford. Um, and we think Derek White is, is locked in. And so I think it's fairly, you know, you – We'll see how much Peyton Pritchard, right? How much Grant Williams, exactly how much we get from from those guys. Please, Lord, no more Daniel Tice. Please. Like, please. I'm, I'm rooting for the Celtics. I can't stand watching Daniel Tice out there. But they're fairly straightforward to me. The Warriors outside of, right, Steph? Steph, Draymond, and Wiggins, I would say. Because even Clay, if you watch the last game, Clay got his minutes cut. Because he's just not – he's not it. He can't, he can't guard like he used to right now. And he's not the same scorer. So they went to a lineup um, with Otto Porter and Gary Payton last game that was successful. And we also saw a little bit more Kavon Looney. So that's kind of the thing that's jumping out to me that almost if you want to kind of bet on Jordan Poole still being volatile and you want to bet on Clay maybe not being old school Clay, I think the money is made amongst the Otto Porter, Gary Payton, Kavon Looney group. And I think we saw Kavon Looney captain actually crush uh, on DraftKings in the in the last slate. So that's my my take. Did you have anything special on like any of those three guys or or Clay or Poole or, you know, the ancillary warriors? Yeah, I mean, Clay had a really rough game last last game. I think I I had some kind of 10 game parlay, right? Cause I got the bonus on, on drafting. I had like a 10 yep. game or 10, 10 thing, you know, uh, single game parlay with a hundred, hundred percent bonus. And I had Clay Thompson over like 15 points and assists at minus 1600. And that was the thing that didn't hit <laughs> on the 10 game parlay. Um, and I, I was like, God, like just, you know, looking at his, his minutes and, um, you know, just praying every shot went in. It's tough to bet against him though, because like yeah. just from DFS perspective, because he is, I mean, he's a three-point shooter, and like, yeah, we. I'm mean, just looking at the the game log right there. Right, one of eight looks terrible. Three of seven is not great. Eight <laughs> of sixteen is really good. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and so I mean that you know that that can be a difference maker. And he's you know unfortunately he's not the same player that we might have thought of like last time Golden State was in the finals and as, yeah. as the injuries. Uh, but he still can be very effective from a three-point line, and like he's not a guy that would necessarily look to fade based off of his last game just because like yeah if he, I mean, he has one of those eight of 16 three-point shooting games i mean he's the the ca- optimal captain or the mvp or whatever mm-hmm. it is right and i actually think that's what 
kind of talked about like the ebbs and flows of playoffs, right? The Celtics have one good game and then one bad game. And we keep going back and forth, like from a market sentiment perspective. But I think from a, that is even more evident in showdown, right? So Jordan Poole after game one, everybody is like, nope, this dude stinks. He might not play, right? That's this. And, and I, I, I didn't even really disagree. But it, the whole sentiment was like, nope, he can't play in this series. You know, they're going to go to Otto or Gary Payton or, you know, Iguodala ended up missing the game. But it's going to be someone like that. Well, then Jordan Poole, shocker, a good basketball player, bounces back and has a, a decent game as raining half-court three-pointers at the buzzer and stuff. Now, it would be the opposite for me. It would be everybody's like, oh, nope, look, Clay got his minutes cut last game. He even almost kind of got benched in the third quarter for these other guys. He's been playing terrible. He's not the same. Well, that's when it's like, well, now take Poole out of there. Now give me Clay. Now give me the, the Clay Thompson um, shares, especially because I, I find it hard to believe that the Celtics aren't going to have some pretty serious adjustments for how they cover Steph uh, specifically. He's really been giving them been giving them fits, which means Clay Wiggins, somebody's got to score. Um, you know, they're not going to score 60 points. They're going to still going to score a hundred points or whatever. So I really like clay. And then the other guy I was going to bring up was, was Wiggins. Um, he's the guy, like you see here, we are projected for 30, 37 minutes. We don't have crazy aggressive minutes projections here on really anybody Tatum, I guess. Um, but I could see upward minutes trajectory for Steph, for clay, for Wiggins and for Draymond, honestly, because this is not one of those old kind of like old school deep warriors teams with the prime Iguodala coming off the bench and, and that kind of stuff. They, they just don't have dudes outside of maybe six guys. And so I think those guys could play a ton and they just need Wiggins, you know, to guard Tatum um, and Brown a little bit for, for every other minute. Um, we can touch on Steph in a sec. Was there any other warriors that have kind of caught your eye? Just I think the the bench is going to be a little bit key in terms of DFS because I think that's where you're really seeing value that, that could hit. Like Bielitsa, I think, was playing in the first half last game. He's pretty cheap. Uh, and then they've got the rookies like Moody and, and Kaminga. And if they decide to give one of those guys run, I think they're minimum priced. And like you never know when yep. Carr is going to like take a shiny to one of those guys and, and put him in. Uh, I pr- probably Kaminga is the guy who would be more likely to, to see some run. Uh, and it, I, I don't think any of these guys are going to play big minutes, but uh, you know, if they, if they play you know, 10 minutes and, and put up some points, they could be the key in, in showdown if they're really cheap. And I think like yeah. Iguodala is uh he has 1000 on DraftKings. I think he's, you know, pretty low priced on FanDuel as well, but he missed last game. But I mean, yeah, 12 minutes in, in game one, I mean, if he plays and he puts up, you know, 10 fantasy points at minimum price, that's, that's the difference maker right there because in the playoffs, like the, the star players tend to play really reliable, big minutes uh, and they're, they're high priced, right? It's like, if you're going to fit like Curry Tatum and say like Jalen Brown, like you might need an Andre Iguodala if he's putting up 10 fantasy points, like that's the, the key that puts it all together. Right. Especially with someone like Steph, who I did not mean to click that off that you have at the top. That's just like, even when he doesn't shoot, he shot five for 17 and scored 40 plus fancy points, right? And in, in 32 minutes, it's just those, him, Tatum, whatever, Jalen Brown, those guys just score so many points. And then when they're scoring so many in fairly low scoring games, right? This isn't going to be 140 to 130. The middle tier then kind of gets squeaked. There's only one basketball. So there's only so much fantasy production that can happen. So when you get the 60 at the top, that 10 from Iguodala, or Moses Moody, or whatever. Uh, it, it, maybe it is Daniel Tice, or whatever. Somebody like that is now the linchpin, and nobody wants to play that guy because, like, there's no real ceiling, right? We're thinking about it from like our lens that we've been thinking through all year, but like, that's not. He's more of the key to unlocking what I can get from from those other higher ceiling guys. I was just gonna, while we kind of wrap up the the Warriors, I was gonna talk about. Uh, Gary, Gary Payton, because I think, you know, he's a little bit more expensive, but I think he's my favorite guy amongst those Warriors, um, again, kind of ancillary players, um, just because I, I don't I don't see a way, you know, so we saw 25 minutes from Gary Payton. I know that there was a little bit of, of the fourth quarter blowout stuff in there, but I, I think with his defense, if the game is close um, and the Warriors are not like really trailing where they need a bunch of offense, I think we could see that 25. We, we've seen that this playoffs. Um, should have kept that up. 
you know, last time when he was playing, we're seeing 23, 25, right? We're, we're, we were seeing real minutes from Gary Payton in the first round. If, if, if Clay's not going, if Poole's not going, and they need his defense on Tatum, Brown, Smart, whatever, I think you could get upper 20s minutes. And he's not like a total zero. He's not an awesome fantasy asset, but he's not a total zero either. He'll, he'll, he'll set screens, right? He hit a three. He, he gets some backdoors and dunks and steals because he's guarding the best player on the other team. So I think he's at least uh, mildly interesting, even though, uh, you know, 3,000 is not 1,000. But um, if we wanted to move up another tier and and we have him, you know, at 25 percent, which isn't amazing. But I think there's other things we can do with a 25 percent owned guy to still make strong teams. Yeah. And I think I actually think it's one situation potentially, because I think if Iguodal is out and then it opens up a lot of minutes for Peyton. And but if Iguodal is in because like he was out for game two, that's when Peyton right. played big minutes. Uh, so like if Iguodal is out, then yeah, I really like Peyton. Uh, if Iguodal is in, then I might take the the savings, right? Because it's it's one thousand, yeah. three thousand. That, yeah. that can be a big difference for for drafting showdown. Yeah, I like that. What about on the the Boston side? As we look down to the Boston side, let's actually start down there at at the bottom. We talked that the Boston side's a little bit kind of more comfortable in terms of their their rotation. I do feel that way. But are you? We talked about Robert Williams. He's a lot more expensive than a, than a cheap guy. Are you? Xing him out? Are you looking to Grant Williams, Peyton Pritchard, any of the the cheaper Boston guys? How are you handling them? I don't like the cheaper Boston guys as much as the the Golden State. Um, I, I'm probably going to play some. Like if I play 150 lineups, I, I probably will. Uh, I'll have some Robert Williams. <laughs> I'm not going to go like overboard. Um, yeah. yeah, Daniel Tice like doesn't do it for me. Like Peyton Pritchard, I'd be a little bit surprised like if his minutes go up. Um, just so, and that, so I think he'll be like efficiently owned. Um, yeah. you know, he is, he's playing some minutes off the bench, but I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think if they need somebody to guard like Steph Curry or, or you know, somebody on the Golden State side, like, I think we're, we're more likely to see like extended dark white minutes than, mm-hmm. than like more Peyton Pritchard minutes. Um, if there's a guy like off the radar, maybe Aaron Nesmith who came in a little bit earlier than yeah. like, the, the garbage minutes, um, so he's got somebody that's like, if I'm looking for somebody super low owned to be putting in like 10% of my lineups or something like that, where I say, I think he's going to be like 1% owned and I'm going to put him in like play him in 10% of my lineups. Uh, it's probably Ness Smith just because I could see him coming in and playing more, a little bit more minutes, maybe at like Pritchard's expense. Yeah. Or he takes those eight Daniel Tice minutes, gets a steal, a block and hits two threes. Right. And like, that's it. And that's it. Or he steals the Tice minutes or the Pritchard minutes. And you get um, just like I said, you get at the one corner three and now the coach's confidence in him is higher. His confidence is probably higher and you get 15, 18 minutes, right? We just, there's a little more fluidity to this as we've seen already in both, in both of these games. I mean, the Celtics have been a little bit more straightforward, but um, throughout the course of the playoffs, like the Daniel Tice thing, even Peyton Pritchard, we've seen games where Peyton Pritchard plays 30 minutes in a in a, a playoff game and then the next game the closeout game against the heat he got benched he got removed from the rotation you know so like the coaches are willing to kind of um adjust game to game and so we should be like willing to embrace some of, of that variance you also have i mean there was 12 minutes of garbage time last game is anyone expecting that again in this series of course not but like 10 per, putting 10 percent of your lineups on one of those guys that might get the four minutes of garbage time and he's going to be taking the shots in the garbage in, in garbage time. I don't see why that's a worse path to winning showdown than, than anything else. Right. Yeah. I think that's a great point because all of these projections are based off of the idea like Boston's going to win by about four. Cause that's the line we're right all in our heads. When we're thinking about how's this game going to play out tonight, we're all expect, you know, kind of playing it out for a Boston four point win or maybe Golden State covers or something, you know, but like, yeah, like they don't cut the DraftKings scoring off just because it's a blowout. And it's just from playing the fourth quarter. Like those, those points still count. Um, and so when you, yeah, when you have it like a thousand dollar guy that is, yeah, like hits the corner three and suddenly like he's, you know, he gets four or five shots in the fourth quarter because it's a 25 point game. Like those are still racking up points and that can affect the, uh, you know, the showdown and single game scoring. So yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and like, yeah, he's the guy like Nesmith's probably my favorite of like the bench crew. For Boston that's that's going to be super low on I like that um and I mean we've had it in both games it was it wasn't a whole quarter like last game in game one but 
the Warriors pulled their guys with multiple minutes left. There was multiple minutes. Uh, so we've had like <laughs> more than a quarter of garbage time already, the total in uh, the first two games. So for Boston, what about what about kind of the main guys? How are you ap- approaching them? You know, we're always going to get the Tatum kind of being the highest owned guy and you're getting Tatum and Steph as the highest owned captains. How are you approaching just generally Boston and then kind of bleed that into, you know, the Tatum captain thing, Steph and, and, and that whole approach? So I think I'm going to be underweight, like dramatically underweight Jason Tatum in the captain spot and the MVP spot. Like, and it's just an ownership thing. Like he's, yeah. he is, I mean, he's, he's probably with Boston playing at home. He's probably the, the highest projected scorer, but I, I mean, I think he's just going to be way over owned in the, the MVP spot. And like for, for this format, what you're trying to do is avoid duplicates almost more than anything else. And mm-hmm. so like, yeah, Jason Tatum is my favorite play tonight. And I'm gonna fade him, right? You know, because we're not gonna <laughs> fade him. I'm gonna be, un, you know, dramatically underweight the field. Um, probably boosting up like Jalen Brown and, and Al Horford. Um, probably Brown the most, uh, just because he hasn't had like a, a great series so far. But mm-hmm. playing at home can be can, can make the difference. And I just think it's some variance. You know, he's probably not gonna shoot five of seventeen again. So like, I think if someone's gonna be, you know, kind of overshooting Tatum on the Boston side is probably going to be Jalen Brown, like maybe Al Horford. Um, but yeah, I'm probably going to be like way under the field on Tatum and the MVP and the captain spots uh, boost up like the other Boston guys, Jalen Brown, Al Horford, uh, probably like Marcus Smart even. Um, and I'll probably be at the field or maybe even a little bit under the field on Steph Curry, just figuring okay. that like Boston's probably going to make an adjustment and, and really key on, you know, on Curry and it's a, it's a road game. So I'll probably like be a little bit under the field on Curry and boost up some of the other Golden State guys like Andrew Wiggins, probably the okay. favorite guy to boost in that situation. So from both, we'll just keep it to to both both sides. But like from a both a DraftKings, you know, DraftKings captain, FanDuel MVP, you would say generally, you know, definitely underweight, massively underweight Jason Tatum at the field or probably underweight Steph Curry too. And then just taking an approach to, you know, maybe you're a little higher on Jalen and a little higher on Wiggins than the rest of the guys on their team. But your general take is give me one of the non Steph Curry, non Jason Tatum captains and like build around, build around that idea. Yeah, exactly. And I'm even uh, playing around more and more with DFS these days about trying to hedge on, on sports betting. Right. And like, yeah, maybe you, maybe you bet the over on the Jason Tatum points, assistant rebounds, or maybe bet the over on Steph Curry points. And then you just fade them in the captain spot and fade them in the MVP spot. If you fade both those guys in the MVP spot on FanDuel, like you're cutting down your duplicated lineups dramatically. And that makes yeah. a big difference in like in the money that you get pulled down. If you end up in, in first place and you don't have to go crazy, right? Like you, you can play some little bit of Aaron Nesmith if we want, but you, you're <laughs> probably going to be duplicated on FanDuel. But like, leave a little bit of salary on the table. Like, don't use Curry or Tatum in the MVP spot. Bet the over on their props if you want. Um, and then, it, but if you if you win, you're like you're much less duplicated, and then you're like paying off the you know your entry fees, and you know you're getting a good payoff. So, yeah, I think um, game two was a Kavan Looney. I'm gonna I'm gonna screw up what the specific winning lineup winning lineup, but I know it was Kavan Looney on DraftKings in in uh, the large field GPP was Kavon Looney, Captain Steph, obviously. And then Tatum, uh, yeah, Wiggins, something like that. It was, I, I can't remember, Derek White maybe. Yeah. Um, but it was, so like you look at the rest of it and you're like, I don't know, that makes sense. Steph Curry, Jason Tatum, you know, Andrew Wiggins, uh, Derek White. Yeah, I love all those guys. But it was just like, well, just put Kavon Looney in captain and be like, okay, even in that scenario, right? Steph had a good game. Let me pull up the, the the Warriors. Steph didn't even have a bad game. It was just sometimes it plays. Right, he scored fifty fantasy points. Sometimes it just plays out in a way. I think a pool was in there, not Wiggins. I think uh, it plays out in a way that's like, look, Kevon Looney has a good game, not like a masterful game. It was a good game, uh, and Steph has a good game, but he just doesn't go for sixty five or seventy. Right. There is a way you can like like you were talking about hedging. There's a way that both of those things can be true. If none of the cheap guys do anything and Kevon Looney just happens to have a good enough game or right or Andrew Wiggins, Al Horford, Marcus Smart have that. And then you just play that scenario out where I don't need, uh, you know, you mixing through your lineups. Yeah, we're talking about Aaron Naismith and we're talking about Peyton Pritchard and stuff. But like simply, especially like you said, on FanDuel and leaving some money on the table. 
you just you just cut your duplicates like infinity amounts. Like everybody won in a what a half a million dollar prize pool. Everybody won fifty k the other night uh, from from that team, and they didn't play anyone outrageous. Literally, no one outrageous. It was just the fact that Kevon Looney was in the captain. That was it. Yeah, exactly. Like that makes all the difference. It's it's a little bit trickier on Fanduel because, like, on Fanduel, if you fade a guy in the MVP spot, you're really saying you expect somebody else to score more fantasy points. Mm-hmm. DraftKings, that's not the case at all, right? It's it's all about right. like the the value. And yeah, you know, you fit in Kevon Looney, and I've seen some crazy teams late, you know, in in these formats that are in the top 100 that are like very lightly duplicated because I've got someone super cheap in the in the captain spot. It doesn't have to be someone coming in off the bench, like a Damian Lee, like who would have thought, you know, that Golden State had three guys injured in this game, Damian Lee, you know, to the rescue. (laughs) No, it's like, it's, you know, somebody that you know is going to get minutes. They're just a little bit cheaper, like a Kavon Looney. And they, you know, they're in the captain spot, Derek White, maybe in the captain spots. And suddenly a top hundred team that, you know, that is fitting in all the other pieces that are giving you the raw points on DraftKings. Like, you know, so then that fits in like Steph Curry, Jalen Brown and, and Jason Tatum. Yep. I, I couldn't possibly agree more. So I, I think we mostly covered kind of all the different angles, the cheap guys, how to approach captain, how to approach both, both the different sites. Now we always do this, right? When we, when we do these shows, what's the thing, what's the, what's the, we just talked about some of the different ways you might be able to get unique or how to construct your teams to kind of take down, take down first. What, what's the one thing as of right now that you're going in, you talked about uh, maybe outside of underweight Tatum. What's the other thing that you're like, this is the thing I feel most uh, you know, passionate about. I'm going to do in more of my lineups than any other scenario. Probably just being overweight Jalen Brown. Again, I kind of see it as a Jalen Brown game. I thought he was going to have a better series than he's had so far. There isn't anything that makes me think of it. It's like he's like hurt or out of, you know, it's obviously like not out of rotation or, you know, or seeing less minutes or anything. It's just, he hasn't shot well. And yeah. going back home, I think, you know, he can shoot well. I think he's going to be lower owned based on the series, you know, the way it's played out so far. And like, especially on FanDuel, like he's going to be way under owned, I think in the, in the MVP mm. spot. So yeah. Yeah. Going to load up on some Jalen Brown MVP, uh, you know, maybe, you know, be a little bit overweight on Clay Thompson just because I think people are a little bit down on him and he's a guy that I can see bouncing back just based on the shooting. Uh, so I think, yeah, Jalen Brown on the the Boston side, Clay Thompson, probably on the golden state side, maybe a little bit overweight on Andrew Wiggins. Um, mm. I'm FanDuel, maybe a little bit on uh, on Draymond Green as well, just because like those blocks and steals like, at three points, it, it makes such a big difference compared to DraftKings where they're only two. And like yeah. Draymond is a guy that can, you know, yeah, it suddenly ends up with like three blocks and a couple steals, and that's like that's 15 points. Um, you know, and, <laughs> and so if he's having a decent game, you know, outside of that, like that that boosts him possibly into like the the second spot on on FanDuel. Um, so yeah, I think. Basically, you know, if there's one thing, it's going to be that I'm going to be I'll have a little bit of a Jason Tatum fade in the the higher spot, like the captain and the MVP spots, and just be overweight like Jalen Brown and boost like some of the secondary Warriors guys. I love that Jalen Brown has been uh, outside of Derek White. I guess I would say that that was kind of my general take on the series, and I'm not straying from that because of exactly hey, he had a good game game one. He was good. He was actually the key to them winning. In that fourth quarter, he just like took over the game, um, and he also completely dominated Clay Thompson on the defensive end too. He was the linchpin to them coming back and just destroying the Warriors in Game One. So now, think about what that means. He clearly has that in him, right? We actually haven't seen much of that from Jason Tatum. He hit some threes in the first half of Game Two to where it made it look like his box score was a little bit better, but he didn't play particularly well. And they've really been giving him fits versus. Jalen shot the ball bad in game two, but he's been the one that's kind of shown like, whoa, he can really take over this series from the Celtics side of things. So I'm sticking with Derek White. Um, that's going to be like my t- – Derek White is going to be in the optimal in every game in the series or whatever. It's like my, my – t- I mean, his price might get out of control eventually, but I just think he's that important. And I totally agree on the Jalen Brown thing and then Wiggins. Wiggins would be my uh, my Warriors guy. Pretty much all the same stuff that you that, that, that you said. I think he's just the guy that they need. Right. It sounds so crazy that like after Steph Curry, you're like, well, Andrew Wiggins might be the most important player for the Warriors, uh, even though like they didn't even like, nobody wanted him. You know, pe- they, pe- uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves couldn't give him away a couple of years ago. And now he's like the key to the Warriors. But I really do think that's the case. And he does enough scoring and he does enough other stuff. So there you go. Underweight Tatum 
overweight Jalen Brown, overweight Derek White, overweight Andrew Wiggins. Um, anything else? Did you bet this game? No, not yet, but I am. I'm thinking if I bet it would be the Boston side, just figuring that I think like the home court could be a, a big deal. And it's, I think, like, yeah, I think Boston's better than, than people expected. There we go. Big bounce back spot for the Celtics. I, uh, have a bunch of futures on them to win the title. So every, both of these first two games have been a roller. It's been a roller coaster ride. The first one was a, a lot of fun. And the second one was not a lot of fun. Um, uh, having that much riding on the Celtics, but that is it. That wraps it up for me, Eric fine for, for John Breslin, AKA squirrel patrol. I don't know if it's you and I that will be back. Someone will be back um, for every game of this series with a similar show. Hopefully we'll be talking about a two, one Celtics lead in game four, but um for us and for producer Devin behind the scenes, uh, we will see you guys. 